Good morning and welcome to session 11A. Uh, we're here in Oxford. Um, I'm delighted to have a great lineup of speakers today. My name's Ross Anderson. I'm going to be chairing this session. A few pointers before we get going. At the top of your screen, you'll find a reconnect button. So if for any reason you do lose the stream, you can click that button and hopefully you'll be reconnected. The other thing is that at the side of the screen, there is a chat box. And as we go through all the talks, feel free to put all your questions in the chat and we'll collate those and ask the speakers. So excited to have a great session and we're going to get going straight away. Um, our first talk this morning is by Kieran Hickman Lewis. Diverse communities of bacteria and archaea flourished in Earth's earliest ecosystems. So I'm just going to bring up the slides now. And then we can get going. So take it away, Kira. Thank you very much. So I hope that you can all hear me. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you might be. So this is a presentation about paleontology in deep time, and specifically about the oldest traces of life from the Paleoarchean. The Paleoarchean is the time in Earth's history spanning from approximately 3.2 to 3.6 billion years ago, from which we have the oldest reliable and well-constrained fossil record, and therefore the oldest archive of co-evolving Earth and life. I think that the Paleoarchean is best thought of as a four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, thousands of pieces in diameter, 90% of which are missing. And every good data point we have helps to add detail or some, or, or, or some uh, modicum of understanding to this distant world. So in this presentation, I will cover some of our research from the last five years, which concerns reconstructing co-evolving environments and ecosystems in the deepest fossil record. I mostly want to talk about three broad ideas in Archean paleontology. The first is that although we, we still generally consider the Archean to be a problematic, unassailable world which is rife with uncertainty and suspicion and interpretation. This really shouldn't be the case. That in, in, indeed, the Archean, although challenging, is a rich archive of paleontological and paleoenvironmental information. And a number of emerging and innovative high-resolution approaches are continually unveiling a wealth of new details on Earth's early biosphere. Now, there are admittedly few localities from which one can study the earliest traces of life. However, of these, the Barberton Greenstone Belt of Southern Africa, which you see a photograph of in the background, perhaps preserves ancient fossils with the highest degree of fidelity. So since this is a paleontological meeting, I want to talk to you about biodiversity in the Archean. Most of our studies focus on the Barberton Greenstone Belt that I've already mentioned, and primarily on its widespread microbial mats. Now, most of these microbial mats come from volcanic clastic and black and white charts, such as those shown in the photographs and photomicrographs at the left of the screen. The oldest traces of life in Barberton are microbial mats, from the middle marker horizon, which are approximately 3.47 billion years old, which we described in our 2018 Precambrian research article. But as shown in the stratigraphic column on the right, microbial fossils and particularly microbial mats are found throughout the, entire, the entirety of the stratigraphy of Barberton. And I will focus on the four highlighted horizons, which are the 3.3 to 3.5 billion year old Joseph Stell, Footbridge, Hukunug, and middle marker shirts. As a brief point before we delve into the paleontology of ancient life, we need to understand its settings, geological and geochemical. We can do the geochemical part of this using a point laser ablation ICPMS and analyses, which enable us to measure uh, enable us to measure trace and rare earth element compositions of the host rocks of microbial fossils, which indicate the chemistry of their depositional environments. On the screen, I'm showing you the middle market shirt as an example. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that samples are mostly characterized by heavy rare earth element in enrichment, for example, ytterbium, lutetium, um, and positive anthonym anomalies, that's all in blue, which indicate marine precipitation. 
These are coupled with positive europium anomalies, always in red, which are diagnostic of the ubiquitous presence of reducing hydrothermal activity. Now, if you move to the patterns on the right lower hand side of the screen, you see that the patterns on the right hand side, which are outlined in orange, these are analyzed directly from within microbial mats themselves. By comparison to the, com to, to the patterns on the right, they are enriched in light rare earth elements like lanthanum, cerium, and praseodymium. And they are devoid of any of the, any of the anomalies in lanthanum and europium that I spoke about a moment ago. So these patterns indicate terrigenous riverine chemistries, indicating therefore the presence of proximal continental land masses. So in a brief summary, the fossiliferous horizons of the Archean are associated with complex aqueous chemistries at the confluence of marine, hydrothermal, and, and riverine environments, which are best interpreted as epicontinental basins with periodic marine recharge. So now that we've dealt with the environment, what of its inhabitants? In our most recent study, which was published three months ago in paleontology, we used a Fourier transform infrared microspectroscopy, hereafter called FTIR, to identify the relics of biomolecules in the organic materials that comprise paleoarchaean microbial mats. Although many of these mats have been metamorphosed to lower green schist fasces, this does not mean that they do not preserve any traces of their original biomolecules. As you see with the spectra on the right-hand side, they do. Paleoarchaean microbial mats preserve relics of their aromatic, aliphatic, carbonyl, and carboxyl groups that together indicate the, the n n n n n n n n nature and composition of precursor biology. The spectra shown on this slide specifically show the aliphatic complexity in some of our samples, for example, the presence of relics of methylene CH2 and N-methyl CH3, which are recorded in these mats. The relative proportions of methylene CH2 and N-methyl CH3, that's um, shown as the ratio R3-2 on the left-hand side, these are controlled by, the, by their composition in membrane lipids of cells. And the composition of membrane lipids is among the fundamental compositional differences between the three domains of life. So for the prokaryotes, which are of relevance to the Archean, the key difference is that bacteria have dominantly membranes composed of fatty acid membrane esters. These are, these are, these are longer and less branched than the highly branched, shorter, isoprenoid ether, ether lipids, which comprise the membranes of archaea. As a result, the ratio of CH3 to CH2 can be used as a tool for biological identification. And in the Archean, this R32CH3CH2 ratio is best described as domain level taxonomy. Now, taking our four microbial horizons as an example, we see that the Huguenot microbial mats, that's HC in the middle of the graph, are characterized by CH3, CH2 ratios, which are very low and consistent with bacterial fatty acid membranes. In contrast, the middle marker mats are dominated by high ratios ab above 0.8, 0.9, that are dominated by high ratios characteristic of archaeal isoprenoids. As you see, the Footbridge and Joseph style mats exhibit a wider range somewhere between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, which are, which are diagnostic of the membrane lipids of a mixed consortium of organisms. The other components, for example, that I mentioned, the, the carbonyls and the carboxyls, these are probably dominantly found in the extracellular polymeric substances of the microbial mats and therefore have no, no direct bearing on the taxonomic classification of these mats, merely on their, on their nature as microbial mats. So in the paper, we performed a whole host of statistical analyses on these data, the most informative of of which was a principal components an, 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 an analysis showing that although microbial mats comprise a diverse complement of organic materials and 
organic moieties, it is the CH3 to CH2 ratio that defines the majority of the variance in their biomolecular composition and indeed in their spectral variance. So this enables us to distinguish paleoarchaean microbial mats at a taxonomic level, and that's what I've, I've attempted to do on the qualitative Venn diagram at the right-hand side. We can say which of our samples contain microbial mats that were dominated by bacteria. We can estimate which of them were dominated by archaea, and we can make a suggestion as to the degree of mixing of these domains of life in microbial mats that are mixed. So this is the first time that such constraints have been placed on archaean microbial mats, and we hope that this helps somehow to define the ecosystem structure present in the earliest life. So that's one part of archaean biodiversity. In addition to microbial mats, we also have abundant carbonaceous material in the form of clots in the same horizons, one of which I show you in the photomicrograph on the left-hand side of the screen. So in addition to biomolecular relics, paleoarchaean organic materials in fossil-bearing horizons also contain tr a trace element signatures, which we interpret could result from the nature of their original biomass. So in our scientific reports article from earlier this year, we reported trace elements, particularly transition metals that are preserved and enriched in archaean organic materials relative to the matrix. When interpreted within a well-constrained paleoenvironmental context, as I spoke about with the rare earth element work earlier on, we suggest that these elemental en enrichments can reflect a relic of the, of the metalome of the original biomass. The metalome specifically reflects the chemical selection of elements according to, ce uh, according to cellular requirements. In other words, it's the inorganic composition of the metallocenters that make up metabolic cellular nanomachines and enable them to operate. And you see an, the analyses here by particle-induced X-ray emission spectroscopy showing a specific enrichments in, for example, iron, nickel, copper, and arsenic. We find that numerous transition metals are strongly enriched to similar levels within organic microstructures relative to their matrix. On the left-hand side, we compare these with species of anoxygenic anaerobic metalomes of extant biomass, and we can suggest, for example, that organic material which is particularly enriched in iron or nickel may indicate methanogenetic precursors, or that iron and vanadium, if occurring together, may denote nitrogen cycling. And this means that a record of metabolism can be presented, uh, preserved in carbonaceous material throughout deep time, as is already known from fossils of the Phanerozoic. So I've spoken a lot about exceptional preservation, given the age of these rocks, and the agent of that preservation is silica. Silicification in the Archean occurs exceptionally rapidly. I would argue it begins within hours and is completed within days. I'd like to therefore complete, uh, to, to conclude with a brief statement of the fact that not only is rapid preservation ideal for archiving biogeochemistry, but also for preserving morphology with high fidelity in three dimensions. On this slide, we return to the microbial mats and we show that in high re resolution CT scans, we can see microscale evidence of microbial behavior. For example, tuft or pinnacle formation as shown in the yellow circle at the right, or mat sediment interactions, such as the trapping and binding of sediment particles. For example, the red granule also shown at the right. And we can find these even in highly recrystallized objects such as stromatolites from the Dresser Formation, but I think we don't have time to go to that in detail today. So returning to my initial points, I hope that this brief overview has convinced you that there is much detail to be garnered from studying paleoarchaean microbial ecosystems. It isn't an unassailable world. We require only to harness the techniques and innovation which are required to extricate this information. Uh, hopefully with time, an increasingly detailed picture of archaean life should enable us to move away from understanding these ecosystems on a fossil by fossil basis and to start considering the early biosphere in terms of its interconnected biomes, its metabolic networks, much as we know on the earth today. 
At the end of the presentation, and on that note, I'd like to ext <laughs> extend my thanks to the organizers for giving us an opportunity to present in this very fine virtual conference hall. And I'll thank all of you there for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions here and in the chat. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Kieran. Great talk. So we've got quite a lot of questions, and I think we've only got time for probably one. So we're going to go to a question from Jakob Winter. And Jakob says, it's a kind of a two-part question. He says, does Tough Sims or Pi GCMS give us more clues to the preservation and nature of the micro organic material? And then he goes on to say, I believe melanins and humid acids have propensities for absorbing metals during diagenesis. It may be worth considering refutation of subsequent metal sequestration of the microbial mat organics. These are very good questions. And in, in, in answer to the first point, uh, TOF sims hasn't, hasn't been widely applied in Archean materials due to concerns over uh, 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 concerns of contamination. But um, pyrolysis GCMS, that has been used on on a materials from the from the dresser formation, organic materials from the dresser formation, to suggest th th that the mass distributions, mass peak distributions, are consistent with microbial origins. At the moment, I don't believe it's given us any greater any greater specificity. In answer to the second question about the accumulation of metals during diagenetic processes. From silicification experiments, we know that the preservation of microbial materials under, uh, under expected Archean concentrations of silica occurs within hours to days. So the microbes are in fact still alive during the, during the process, during the, in, during the in, initiation of their silicification processes. In this regard, any diagenesis which occurs in these cherts is considered to be very early and still while the microbes exert the dominant influence over the passage of metals in their environment. As a final note, the silicification forms a kind of time capsule of preservation, meaning that, meaning that subsequent diagenetic alteration is generally considered to, to be close to zero, but I'll be happy to talk about that more in the chat. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Kim. There's a few more questions, so please go to the chat and, and answer those. And now we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker, I'll just bring up the slides now, is Alison Cribb, who's going to be talking about growing pains of the agronomic revolution. So I'll just bring up the slides and take it away, Alison. Thanks, Ross. Um, and thank you all for um, tuning in this morning. Greetings from the States, where it is so early the sun's not even up. Um, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Southern California. And today I want to talk to you about some biogeochemical modeling work that we've been doing on EDAC and Cambrian bioturbators. But before I jump in, I just want to thank everyone who's listed on the screen here. Um, they've been of tremendous help for the last about four years. Um, and I also want to thank funding from GSA and SCPM, and then finally extend a huge thank you to the Palace meeting organizers for the opportunity to um, speak today. So I'm really interested in recharacterizing the agronomic revolution in terms of ecosystem engineering and from a sedimentary biogeochemical perspective. Um, so just to recap what we've sort of just thought about the agronomic revolution historically, in the early to mid Ediacaran, um, the seafloor was really capped with uh, microbial mats that caused a sealing effect and prohibited oxygen diffusion to the sediment that in combination with some geochemical evidence that suggests these were sulfate reducing communities um, that would have driven poor waters to be eucenic, meaning oxygen poor and sulfide rich. And then moving um, closer to the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary into this transition zone, um, this is when we start to see um, bioturbation really kick off. So we have rather small and shallow bioturbation, but it's still um, increasingly complex behaviors. So that sediment mixing would have disrupted the microbial mats and allowed more oxygen to diffuse into the sediment. And that process just keeps continuing into the mid-Cambrian and early Paleozoic, where bioturbation is getting larger, more intense, you have deeper mixing, um, and that's causing 
more and more oxygen to diffuse into the sediment as it gets away from, or as it gets rid of the microbial mats and really stimulates a lot of nutrient cycling in benthic ecosystems. And that's largely why sometimes when we think about the agronomic revolution, we consider it an expansion of the benthic habitable zone um, as bioturbation we think may have actually allowed animals um, to burrow deeper into the sediment um, and live at deeper tiers. So from the trace fossil record, we would expect to see burrow depth um, decreasing, so things are getting deeper and bigger, and then the impact and complexity of ecosystem engineering from the trace fossil record is also increasing at the same time. But I would argue that what's been missing from this picture of the agronomic revolution is a focus on precise bioturbation behaviors and what they really mean for sediment biogeochemistry. So what do I mean when I talk about bioturbation? Um, so bioturbation refers to any and all biogenic sediment mixing, but because sediment is a two-phase medium made up of um, the solid sediment particles and the solutes and the pore waters, it's a lot more accurate to break bioturbation up into um, what exactly is being mixed. So we have biomixing, which refers to the transport of the solid sediment particles, and bioirrigation, um, which is the enhanced mixing of solutes between the pore waters and the sediment water interface. And breaking this up is really critical because in the modern environments, we know that these two processes can have very different and sometimes opposite effects on sediment biogeochemistry. So if we want to understand exactly the role bioturbation played and changes to sedimentary biogeochemical cycling across the agronomic revolution, um, we really need to consider bioturbation as these two separate mixing processes. So in that context, I have two questions that I want to address today. First, could EDAC from Cambrian bioturbators have even caused significant biogeochemical changes, at least on a local scale that we'll test today? And second, did the evolution of bioturbation create more habitable benthic environments for other animals across the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary? So to do this, um, we use biogeochemical reactive transport modeling. Um, so for um, sediments, this uses these two mass balance equations for solids, solutes and solids. Um, and this is where we parameterize bioturbation in our models. So for the solutes transport, that's where we um, build in bioirrigation. Um, that's in this whole bioirrigation transport bit of the equation. And those alpha Z values are bioirrigation coefficients um, through the entire sediment column depth. And then it's the same story for the solids transport. This is our biomixing transport. And that dBZ value, um, those are a series of biodiffusion coefficients through the sediment profile. So finding um, representative bioirrigation and biodiffusion coefficients in deep time can be really tricky. In the modern environment, we use radio tracers, and that's um, not super applicable to the rocks. Um, so we, we um, use the ecology that we see in the trace fossil record. So I've been doing field work um, in two places um, for the last about four years. First, in the NAMA group, Namibia. These are my Ediacaran sections. Um, I've been working a lot with Charlotte Kensington on this, so you might have seen her present some of the trace fossils that we found in past Palace meetings. Um, and then more recently, I've been working in the White Inyos Mountains in California, and those are my Cambrian sections. Um, so these are all shallow marine paleo environments in the NAMA. They're, they're well above fair weather wave base, um, and they all occur in siliciclastics. And so on the left here, I'm just showing you the composite stratigraphic sections of the two localities. And the NAMA, we're specifically focusing on the Bitfoot subbasin because we have much better trace fossils. Um, and then I've shown you just the relative correlations of the Ediac and Cambrian boundary. And that's based on the first occurrence of Treptichnus pedum. So I've been working on three localities that I'm going to present today. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail about the trace fossils. Um, but if you want to read more about the descriptions of the trace fossils and how we've sort of come up with these ecosystem engineering behaviors in the NAMA, um, I'd recommend that you check out this Earth Science Reviews paper. Um, that just came out officially um, earlier this week. So first, um, the oldest section I've been working on is the NOSEP Huns transition. Um, this specifically refers to the siliciclastics at the top of the NOSEP and the base of the Huns. Um, and most of what's in the NOSEP Huns transition are fairly small and shallow um, trace fossils, but we do see the first treptichnids in the NAMA group, um, as shown um, in the insert A and B. They're really small and they're really shallow. Uh, but they are that same complex conveying behavior that we see from Treptichnus pedum. And then moving up section close to the Ediac and Cambrian boundary, I've been working in the Spitzkopf member. Um, this is the most diverse and complex bioturbation behaviors that we see in the NAMA group. Um, so this is the section at Fish River Canyon that I've been working a lot on. Um, and in plate F, you'll see that we have a trace fossil that's quite large. That's called Parasamic 90s pretzeliformis. Um, it's a sediment bulldozing trace fossil. It's 
been described as by Louis Boutois um, as like the first Siloma Great Trace fossil that we see. And then in um, figure H, that's a larger treptichnid, um, but still a precursor to treptichnus pedum. So we're still seeing that same sort of vertically penetrative conveying behavior before we start to see um, um, like official And then finally, moving into the Cambrian, I've been working in the upper member of the Deep Spring Formation. These are pretty typical of um, early Cambrian trace fossil beds. They're, they're densely biotrated, they're quite complex, and they're mostly made of things like planolites and Torwangia and Treptichnus. So ultimately, um, I've built a Monte Carlo reactive transport model, and that simulates how biotrace can affect um, different biogeochemical cycles. So just to get into the workflow, um, I take trace fossils from those three localities, and then I sort of transform them into biodiffusion by irrigation distributions um, based on trace fossil pointing, um, point counting of the bedding planes, um, the ecosystem engineering impact values from Liam Herring Shaw's um, paper, and then a comparison between the hypothesized trace maker and modern taxa for which um, these, these coefficients are much better understood. Um, so I built a 1D reactive transport model, so it's just up and down. Um, using the R package Reactran. This has 12 reactions built in to simulate carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, and sulfur cycling. And then I'm running them at boundary conditions for um, the friends of anoxic mud locality. And then we integrate this with the Monte Carlo model by running 1,000 steady state solutions for each of the trace fossil localities. So each of those solutions draws a random biodiffusion and bioirrigation coefficient from the distributions that I've built. Um, and then the final profile that we'll sort of analyze is the average of all 1,000 of those steady state solutions. And today I'll be showing you the oxygen, organic matter, sulfate, sulfide, and ferrous iron profiles. Just to sort of go through the anatomy of these um, figures before we jump in. So this dashed line is always gonna be the no biotrophation steady state. This is kind of our control that we'll compare back to. These colors will change, but um, the more opaque our high frequency, this is where um, the 1,000 um, simulations are plotted as a heat map, and where they're more opaque is where the model agrees on the profile more. And then the lower frequency colors are represented as less, or the lower frequency solutions are represented as less opaque colors. And then this solid black line is the average of 1,000 simulations. So this is the NASA punch transition. These are our results. Um, I just wanna point out a few key things. First, we see evidence for oxygen consumption. Um, so there is a heat map there, but it's all really sort of behind that average profile. There's, there's almost no variability, um, which I'll get into later. And then we see organic matter mixing. This profile is becoming more homogenized. For sulfur, we see a decrease in shallow sulfates and an increase in shallow sulfide concentrations. And then for ferrous iron, we see this, this nice little peak in ferrous iron concentrations. Although I will say the concentrations themselves are quite small. This is the Spitzkopf member. Again, this is just below the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary in the NAMA group. And this is kind of the same story where we see oxygen consumption, again, really low variability. We see a bit more organic matter mixing, a same level of decrease in shallow sulfate and an increase in shallow sulfides, um, and a slightly larger increase in ferrous iron, although it's, it's not much. And then for the Cambrian, um, moving into the deep spring formation, same sort of thing, we still see oxygen consumption. We see the most organic matter mixing here. That organic matter profile is pretty homogenized at this point. Um, and here's where we see the largest decrease in shallow sulfates and the largest increase in shallow sulfides. Um, and a so, sort of similar increase in ferrous iron concentrations that we saw before. So just to compare the average sediment profiles to start to draw some conclusions. Again, this is our no bioturbation case. This is the Nasep Huns. This is the Spitzkopf. And this is the Deep Spring. Um, and now we can compare all of them. So first, um, like I said, we don't see an increase in the oxygen penetration depth, which is kind of unexpected from what you would um, think of from a, like a Silocarian point of view of the agronomic revolution. Um, and there's really, really low variability both in the Monte Carlo analyses and between the trace fossil assemblages themselves. And that's largely due to the high organic carbon loading. Um, there's a lot of labile organic carbon in the system, which is really, really reactive. And that plus more biomixing stimulates aerobic carbon remineralization. So the more uh, biomixing intensity is reflected in the, in the increasing homogenization of the organic matter profile. And I wanna emphasize that this is really, really key for transporting organic matter below the OPD, because that's how you stimulate anaerobic pathways such as sulfate reduction and dissimilatory iron reduction. 
which is why if you look at our sulfur profiles, we see across the ED Akron Cambridge boundary, these decreasing sulfate and increasing sulfide concentrations. And that's reflected by this stimulation of the um, sulfate reduction pathways due to this increased organic matter bioavailability. And I wanna emphasize that this is really important when you're talking about habitability of the sediment, because if you are an aerobic metazoan, increasing sulfide concentrations is not great. And finally, um, just to sort of hit at home, this increase in ferrous iron concentrations is due to the stimulation of iron reduction. So just to bring it back to my two questions for these conclusions, um, I would say that ED Akron Cambrian biodegraders definitely could have caused biogeochemical changes, um, at least on a local scale. And in terms of whether or not they created more habitable benthic environments, I'd say no. The shallowing of the OPD and the increase in sulfide concentrations, like I said, is not great if you're an aerobic metazoan. Um, a way to ameliorate this is to intensify bioirrigation to actually flush a lot more oxygen into the sediment, but those are not behaviors that we observe um, in, in these trace fossil assemblages. So with that, I'll take questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Alison. That was a great talk. Um, we don't have any, uh, oh, we actually do. We just had a question come in uh, from Nicholas Herman. Do you incorporate patchiness in conditions and poor water flow due to burrowing? Sure. Um, so since they're just 1B models, we don't incorporate any of the patchiness that you might see between like how much microbial mat and how much biotration there is. Um, and then for poor water flow, um, yes. So the we, we, we incorporate things like tortuous diffusion. Um, things are moving in and out of the poor waters for sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I have actually one question, which was um, obviously in the, the successions you're looking at, they're one particular locality and one particular type of lithology in most cases. Do you think that they're representative of what's going on globally, or do you think this is more what you're tracking here is a local versus a global phenomenon? Yeah, I think these are really local. These are really local results. Um, I think it's difficult to, to understand the global phenomenon of bioattribution across the Ediac and Cambrian boundary because it is so patchy at different localities. Um, so people have incorporated bioattribution to COPS and like that's given us some interesting results. But um, as a whole, I think any modeling we do of bioattribution is, is always gonna be quite local because it's so different depending where you are in lithology and paleo environment, yeah. Great, thanks. So there's another question that's just come in the chat, but we're gonna actually move on. So if you wouldn't mind trying to answer that in the chat, that'd be great, but thanks so much. Um, our next presentation is going to be given by Catherine Mascord. I'm just going to load her presentation up now. So Catherine's talk is called The Colonization of Anoxic Background Dominated Sedimentary Environments During the Early Phanerozoic. So take it away, Catherine. Um, so, the, hi. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about my uh, PhD research at the University of Hull. Um, currently a fourth year PhD student. Um, so let's get started then. Uh, so for a bit of context on my work, um, in a modern marine environment, burrowing animals are a major control on a number of conditions within the sediment, in particular sediment oxygenation, because as they burrow, they increase the surface area of the sediment water interface, thus increase the area over which oxygen diffusion can take place. Thus, they help to increase the oxygen content within the sediment. Uh, they also help to mix and redistribute material within within sedimentary conditions um, as they recycle and rework deposited material and prevent the buildup of say of and prevent the buildup of often quite a uh, uh, toxic uh, waste product of decay like sulfur, which um, yeah. Um, because they do this, they help to maintain environments suitable for themselves and for other other um, burrowing animals or in fauna um, within the within the sediment. Um, when you have an environment where, for whatever reason, you, you uh, burrowing animals aren't present, you see the development of this anoxic and often very sulfur rich sediments simply because these animals aren't here to introduce oxygen or to rework uh, waste materials. Um, under such conditions, because of the lack of uh, sediment disruption by animals, you often see the growth of uh, microbial mats or microbial mat grounds, which, are, which probably most of you know, which are sort of communities of microorganisms which basically glue themselves and the host sediment together. 
by the secretion of extracellular polymeric substances. Um, this can help further inhibit sediment oxygenation because it's sticky and thus inhibits sediment erosion and prevents um, uh, oxygen from being actively mixed into the sediment. Uh, these kinds, the as a result, the anoxic conditions um, associated with macrogram growth is is often um, quite inhospitable to many forms of modern mod, modern burrowing animals. So you you don't often get these extensive macrogram growths developing at the same time as um, as uh, as sort of as diverse um, informal communities. Um, these kinds of macrogram dominated anoxic and often very sulfur rich sediments are typical of what you'd see in Edicarin, particularly as we know um, macrograms are very common in Edicarin era sediments because of the preservation of um, wrinkle structures and elephant skin fabrics or other microbially induced sedimentary fabrics on the sediment surface. Um, animals during this time, while they do leave some trace fossils, in particular near surface trails or very, very shallow burrows, you rarely see any burrowing. Well, um, there, there are um, very few of them, if, if none of them, are capable of burrowing more than a few millimetres into the sediment surface. Um, however, by the end of the Cambrian, you see a transition from these um, anoxic conditions into much more modern like marine environments characterized by um, divert sorry characterized by a diverse community of um, of of in fauna um, showing a wide range of different burrowing behaviors including a, a wide range of different burrow morphologies um, However, what exactly caused this transition during the early Cambrian is somewhat unclear, in particular what kinds of adaptations or burrowing behaviours allowed sort of these early animals to survive in this fairly hostile anoxic environment of the early Cambrian, thus allowing, um, so the question is sort of how did they actually initiate sediment colonisation and um, engineer environments suitable for themselves and other organisms during the Cambrian explosion. Um, to try and help answer this, I've been doing some experimental work examining the behaviour of modern animals in lab-generated Egyptarian-like conditions, in particular anoxic or macrogram dominated sediments, and looking at the most um, uh, if the, the most effective burrow burrowing behaviours or burrow morphologies under such conditions. However, these experiments have been dis disrupted somewhat by the uh, pandemic so and the, so as a result they're not finished so today I'm going to be mainly focusing on my geological work um, which I've been using to complement these experiments um, so the main focus of my geological field work has been um, Bell Island in Newfoundland um, the island mainly dates from the upper Cambrian to lower Ordovician um, after the Cambrian substrate revolution um, however it's of interest because it contains a very unique trace fossil communities, um, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, so for a quick introduction onto the uh, sedimentology of the island, it consists of repeated coarsening up sequences of mudstones likely deposited in a lower energy offshore shelf, in, offshore shelf environment, uh, coarsening up into a uh, rippled sands or, um, um, yeah, coarsening up into rippled sands likely deposited in, in a shore face or near shore environment. Um, these are generally interpreters belonging to shallow marine conditions, uh, possi possi um, yeah, and are very typical of sedimentary successions the world over. Um, in terms of body fossils, there aren't only a whole lot associated with the island because as, as shelled fossils on the island are very rare, but the trace fossils on the island are, are um, but it more than makes up for this lack of body fossils by the trace fossils and microbial mat traces you find on the island. So unusually, particularly in modern era sediments, you have both fairly complex uh, trace fossils, including sort of branching burrows and sort of larger, deeper tier burrow morphologies living alongside um, very fairly extensive mat ground growths. This prevents, uh, presents, uh, yeah, this presents a unique opportunity to examine how Sorry, slightly distracted by the track. Um, how early trace fossils interacted with um, the microbial background. Um, thus, um, 
allowing us to have a better insight into what was going on during the early Cambrian that allowed early animals to colonize the uh, sediment. So um, the trace fossil community on the island can be divided into three broad assemblages. Um, the first of it being a sort of a more macron dominated assemblage, which is very, which is much more like the sort of thing you'd see in the Ediacaran. Um, it's generally associated with the mudstones or interbedded silts and sands towards the bottom of the coarsening up sequences and is characterized by fairly extensive microbially induced sedimentary fabrics, in particular wrinkle structures, um, with the only trace fossils being present in these assemblages being simple surface trails. There aren't any larger burrow structures present at all in these communities. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got these biotubated fabrics, which are much more similar to things you'd see in younger rocks or even in the modern era. So they include fairly a fairly diverse community of uh, trace fossils, including branching burrows or more specialised feeding behaviours, um, which you generally associate with a modern community. Um, these um, uh, macron traces within these communities are completely absent, so you don't get any kind of microbially induced sedimentary fabric preserved with these larger and more complex trace fossils. Um, and unlike the macron deposits, these are usually associated with higher energy sedimentary environments, particularly found in the uh, sandstones towards the top of each of these coarsening up cycles. Um, however, what's of most interest is the what I've turned to sort of an intermediate assemblage between the two. It contains both elements from the microbial mat and the um, and the biotubated fabrics. So the microbial traces present on the island consist of very patchily distributed um, uh, microbially induced sedimentary structures. These are often found as very distinct clumps or, or, or patches irregularly disputed or dis dis distributed all over the sediment surface, um, indicating a very irregular uh, macron growth, unlike the that you'd see in the sediments beneath where it's very continuous. Um, surrounding these patches of macrons are these dense biodivation zones consisting of fairly simple trace fossils, um, in particular very shallow horizontally orientated burrows which don't branch, and the occasional diplocraterian U-shaped burrow, uh, though none of which burrow more than a few centimetres into the sediment itself. Um, in particular, these the, the organisms within these very densely packed but not very, not particularly diverse uh, biodivated zones appear to be exploiting these macro patches as they are associated around the edges of them and with some of the burrows printing them actively undercutting the macro deposits or or actively burrowing through them suggesting that these organisms were exploiting the macro to some extent so um so from the results from the observations made in Bell island we can um, the observations made in Bell Island give a number of interesting suggestions into what's going on during the early Cambrian, where you see these transitions from these macro dominated Egyptian environments to a much more diverse modern one. Um, in particular, the, the more opportunistic, simpler organisms are much more effective at surviving in, in macro dominated conditions, so whereas the more complex trace fossils uh, can't survive here in can't don't really coexist with these macrons at all. Um, in particular, the, the fact that you see a macron decline into the increasing um, uh, increasing sedimentary um, into the increasing uh, environmental energy suggests that um, that these these macrons are particularly affected by sediment disruption. So when you get an increase in energy, you see a slight increase in sediment disruption through wave or current action. Thus, the macrons start to break apart. Um, th this suggests that those early early Cambrian in fauna were in were taking advantage of even the slightest um, oppor were opportunistically taking were opportunistically taking advantage of even the slightest type of environmental uh, conditions. So, simple near surface deposit feeding organisms were exploiting. Uh, macrons when they've been broken apart, say, after following a storm, thus allowing them to get access to the sediment when there's, there's, there's the, the macrons themselves were no longer continuous. As a result, you see, in as a result, the sediment colonization was likely initiated by 
fairly simple um, deposit feeding organisms, opportunistically taking advantage of the macro decline following, say, a storm or some sort of extreme event. Once they got a hold of the sediment, they were able to start introducing oxygen as they increase it the uh, due to sediment mixing and the increase in the um, surface area ratio of the um, sediment water interface. Thus, they generate conditions slightly suitable for slightly, even slightly more complex in fauna, which then in turn uh, colonized the sediment and broke apart the macrons even more, which and then in turn created conditions suitable for more animals. Thus, once animals got the were first able to get a, a, a foothold into sediment, they were there was this runaway effect in which where where animals helped to generate conditions more for suitable for even more complex animals. Um, so I uh, hope you enjoyed my brief summary on some of the stuff I've been working on. Um, I'd like to thank the Geological Society of London for a travel grant which helped to fund the field work to Bell Island. And uh, hopefully I'll answer some of your questions in the chat or, or in the afterwards. So um, thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we've got two questions we can take right now. One is from Paul Struther. Are those desiccation cracks in association with the wrinkle structures? Um, I think so, yeah. So, um, what's his name? Uh, so, someone else who worked on the uh, uh, Bell Island before me, I think, I forgot his name, sorry. Um, there's a paper on someone who did a lot of um, work uh, on the on the um, wrinkle structures before me, so there's um, there there are so yeah they are associated with the wrinkle structures. But that's not something I've been looking into. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the, the person. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we'll move on to this, the second question, which is. Oh, uh, Liam's just um, put it. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Liam. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, have you seen any evidence of changes in mineralogy due to redox changes from bioturbation, or has all, this this all been overprinted by later diagenetic know. effects? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? What? It, it, yes, so it's the one by Philip in the chat. It says, hi, Catherine, really interesting stuff. Have you seen any evidence of changes in mineralogy due to redox changes from oh. bioturbation, or has this all been overprinted by later diagenetic effects? So I did some look into um, thin sections. Uh, so this, this isn't quite really my area, so I'm not brilliantly <laughs> versed in, in how to... to, to um, Talk about this, but there appears to be sort of an increase, particular things like micas and that kind of layered um, minerals associated with macrons, whereas these completely disappear when you get sort of um, more, more, a more typical quartz-dominated set of uh, mineralogy in the sands towards the top of the towards when when these oxidation conditions increase. Um, okay, that's great. Yeah, move straight on to the final talk of the session, which is by Jack Shaw. So I'm just going to move on to Jack's slides. So Jack's giving a talk on fossilization potential of marine assemblages and environments. Take it away, Jack. Cool. Thanks, Ross. Um, so, hey, I'm Jack, and today I'm going to walk through some of our recent work on the fossilization potential of marine assemblages and environments. Um, so first, a couple of words about the vagaries of the fossil record. That only a small percentage of all life that's ever existed is preserved in the rock record. And this record is biased by numerous factors, including the fossilization potential of organisms, itself dictated by biotic components, such as the presence of a skeleton and abiotic components, such as substrate. Additionally, the record is biased by other factors, such as temporal averaging and the available rock record. And these biases are pervasive and lead to great uncertainty, but this uncertainty is often overlooked in our reconstructions of ancient life. And for instance, when considering the fossilization potential of higher ranked clades, some two thirds of extant phyla have no hard parts, are unlikely to fossilize. Even large abundant organisms with biomineralized skeletons must survive disarticulation, transport, uh, rock recycling and sampling biases in order to enter the fossil record. And at lower taxonomic ranks, one study suggested that based on the presence of hard parts alone, the proportion of genera likely to leave identifiable fossil evidence in intertidal habitats is only around 30%. And this bias is often quantified as fossilization potential, the percentage of organisms in a community or assemblage expected to leave fossil evidence. Now, a number of studies have proposed a pretty wide range of estimates of fossilization potential, ranging from 30% up to 86%. 
But the small range of sites, habitats, depths, and other covariates analyzed in these studies really limits what we can say about the variation in fossilization potential of assemblages and communities through time. So what we do know is that fossilization potential of assemblages and communities appears to vary significantly. And we also know that this fossilization potential of individual clades uh, varies by factors such as taxon duration. Uh, for instance, longer lived taxa are more likely to have an extensive fossil record, as well as factors such as size and environmental affinity. What we don't have a good grasp on is what actually determines the fossilization potential of assemblages. What causes the variation in the values that the small number of previous studies have proposed? We don't know whether this variation is actually caused by differences in fossilization potential of organisms or environments, or whether it's in fact driven by things like taxon duration. And this ties into the last point. We don't really understand how taxon specific differences scale up to the communities in which these taxa live. And this gap in knowledge is really important as in order to robustly probe paleobiological and paleoecological trends in the fossil record, we must be able to understand the biases that might be affecting apparent trends. For example, we can't take differences in diversity between two environments at face value if the diversity of both of those environments is uniquely skewed. So the question remains as to how fossilization potential varies. In essence, we want to elucidate how much information loss we should expect in fossil deposits. And to reassess this question in a more comprehensive manner than previous studies, we leveraged in advances in neontological and paleontological big data aggregation. And this is really all a precursor to thinking about how information loss may impact paleobiological and paleoecological trends. So to start to get at this question, we calculated expected fossilization potential of modern marine communities in the Ocean Biogeographic Information System database, commonly referred to as OBIS, uh, by comparing them to the paleobiology database as a rough proxy of the known fossil record. So the key thing to note here is that we're taking presence in the PBDB as our indicator of fossilization potential. In doing so, we're able to assess over 20,000 recent assemblages from a range of environments across the globe. And we considered two types of assemblage specific fossilization potential. The first taxon fossilization potential was calculated as the proportion of genera in a living assemblage with fossil occurrences. And this is analogous to the previous methods of calculating fossilization potential. And it essentially tells us how many organisms we expect to leave fossil remains based on biotic characters alone, such as the presence of a skeleton. The second type of um, fossilization potential that we looked at was within environment. And this is calculated as the proportion of genera in a living assemblage with fossil occurrences found in the same environment as the living assemblage. And this provides a measure of the completeness of the fossil record in a particular environmental setting. And we believe that this is a more robust and useful way to consider fossilization potential. So I'm going to briefly walk us through how we calculate these values before moving on to some of the results. So this is essentially what the data looks like. On the left, we have ancient diversity data from the PBDB, uh, which we simply take as genus level faunal lists. And on the right, we have the OBIS data. And here we have occurrences assigned to discrete communities and details about that particular community, such as depth or substrate type and environment. Our PBDB faunal list contains around 55,000 genera. Um, and the OBIS data set contains around nearly 800,000 occurrences spanning and 10,000 genera, um, 2,500 of which are in the PBDB. And these occurrences are separated into, I think, around 21,000 discrete assemblages. And of these 21,000 assemblages, we're able to gather additional habitat information, such as shallow water or reef designations, um, for around 10,000. 8,000 of these assemblages were shallow marine, um, and we were able to actually get substrate grain size for these. So to calculate taxon fossilization potential, we counted how many of the taxa in the modern assemblage shown on the right are recorded in the PBDB shown on the left. In this case, Lingula and Litterina have fossil occurrences, but Neftis doesn't. So the taxon fossilization potential of the assemblage number one is around two over three, 67%. And then we repeat this for the 21,000 assemblages in our modern community data set. To calculate within environment fossilization potential, we're looking to match modern assemblage occurrences with specific environments to ancient genuses occurrences in the same environment. So in this case, we're calculating 
uh, within environment fossilization potential for a shallow water assemblage is seen on the far right. And if we look at that ancient data, we see that Lingula is the only taxon that's in the modern assemblage that's also recorded from the same environment in the modern and the fossil record. So only one of the three taxa in the assemblage fossilizes, and we generate a within environment fossilization potential value of around 33%. To note here, we only calculate this value for the assemblages that we have environmental categorizations for. So that's that subset of around 10,000 assemblages. So for assemblage number one, taxon fossilization potential is 67%, uh, within environment is around 33%. And again, we repeat this for all of our assemblages in the data set. And if we measure all of the assemblages, we find that on average, 38% of taxa in a community are likely to leave some form of fossil evidence. This is taxon fossilization potential. But we're able to break this down by some of the environmental parameters, and I'll walk through a couple of these today. So when broken down by environment, we find that pelagic communities have the lowest values indicative of the relative lack of pelagic taxa in the fossil record, whereas shallow and deep water communities have similar values around 34%. Uh, followed by coral reefs, and then seamounts have the highest values. We can actually further break this down uh, by substrate for those 8,000 shallow water assemblages. When we do so, um, we find that finer grain substrates harbor assemblages with higher taxon fossilization potentials. And this compares to previous results that suggested that uh, taxon fossilization potential doesn't vary significantly between substrates. But when we account for the environmental effects on species distributions via this within environment fossilization potential measure, we get a slightly different picture. And mean within environment fossilization potential is only 29%. In accounting for environments, we find that mean fossilization potentials of most environments is significantly lower than previously calculated. We see little difference in the case of traditionally well sampled shallow water assemblages. However, in some cases, such as seamounts and pelagic assemblages, within environment fossilization potential actually approaches zero, given the lack of representation of these environments in the fossil record. This really underscores the importance of incorporating considerations of environment. And these estimates are likely much closer to kind of the realistic fossilization potential compared to previous estimates. So in considering the drivers behind the trends, we focused on four main hypotheses. We looked at taxon durations, which we found to be greater in shallow and finer grain settings, our best preserved ancient settings. We also looked at the proportion of taxa with high fossilization potentials, so the number of Shelley taxa, um, the representation of different environments in the fossil record, and then we considered sampling biases in both OBIS and PBDB data. And we tested the impact of these variables using conditional inference regression tree models. So simple learning, uh, machine learning based predictive modeling technique similar to random forest algorithms that you might have heard of, uh, but the exact method of deciphering variable importance didn't really change our results too much. And we use this condi uh, conditional inference tree method as it can account for covariation amongst predictive variables and can handle overfitting, nonlinear, nonparametric data, and missing information. For both types of fossilization potential, we found that environment and sampling biases were the most important predictors, whereas taxon duration, depth, substrate held significantly less predictive power. So to summarize the main results, we quantified fossilization potential at the global level and really identified ways in which it consistently varies with environmental variables. And the effect of environment on fossilization potential is not uniform, and it's just really vital to consider it if we want to better understand ecology and evolution at large temporal and spatial scales. The important thing about this work is that by incorporating much more data than before and by considering numerous covariates, we've generated estimates of fossilization potential that could be used to better assess uncertainty in paleontological data, and it may permit more robust comparisons between fossil assemblages, which themselves may represent different environments or areas. So I'm gonna end there today, um, but for a deeper look at the results, check out the paper in geology um, or feel free to drop me an email. And thank you for joining. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. I think we have some time. Um, I just saw a message from Crispin, which says very interesting talk. Um, yeah, the paper was just published in Geology about a month ago. I think it's only online at the moment, but hopefully we'll be out in physical form, I think, January or February. Uh, 
Um, go through these. There's another question here, Jack, from a uh, great talk, by the way. Sorry, my microphone hasn't been on. No um, there's a couple of questions here from uh, Bethany Allen first. How could how much could single taxon monographs, which can lead to incomplete PBDB collections with respect to ecological communities, have on your results? Probably a huge effect. Um, it's one of the things that I've been playing with a lot is just starting to think about um, how much information isn't in the PBDB. And we, we talk about it a lot, but there's been very little kind of quantitative analysis of how much we're missing from the PBDB. Um, I think Charles Marshall did a little bit of work comparing and some of his co-authors comparing museum specimens to PBDB. And yeah, there's a huge amount of missing data. Um, so yeah, I don't don't have a good answer for you, but yeah, I think you are really onto something there um, and needs to be tackled. Okay. Apologies, Jack. I'm just getting, a, uh, there's been a few technical issues this morning, so I'm trying to, I'm just getting some information to give to the audience. I think if it's okay, if you could respond to the rest of the messages in the chat, that'd be great. Um, we're gonna go to the break now. Um, the next session, the room will open on time, but we may start the session just for everybody's uh, information five minutes later than the uh, scheduled sharp start, but the room will open on time. Okay, thank you so much to all the speakers from this session. It's been a really fantastic session and I hope you all enjoyed it and hope to see you after the break. Thank you. <laughs>